Hello. Hey. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Live and kicking. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Where are you located? I'm um, based in the south of Germany. Uh, oh. Kind of near Frankfurt. Oh, nice. How about you? Uh, Minnesota in the U United States. Minnesota. Cool. Never I've been, been to Frankfurt. Frankfurt. Yeah. Been to Frankfurt, oh, nice. but didn't get, a, didn't get out around that area too much. So just saw the city. I liked it though. <laughs> yeah, Frankfurt's a little bit of a metropolis. <laughs> I like that it, it seemed like a, a bigger city, but not like overwhelmingly big. <laughs> So, hello everyone. Uh, this is the Tag Runtime uh, bi weekly meeting. Uh, my name is Heba, and uh, we, uh, we will have the Craft Kit um, project today to, um, to present. Uh, just to, you know, like remind everyone that this meeting uh, is under uh, code of, uh, CNCF Code of Conduct, which means be nice, be kind to each other. And uh, I believe we can go ahead and uh, hand it to Alexander. Brilliant. Uh, thanks so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. Brilliant. OK, great. So hi, yeah, I'm Alex. Um, I'm a maintainer um, of the Unicraft project and uh, particularly a sub project within Unicraft called CraftKit. Um, today, I'm going to be giving a project update uh, for CraftKit. Uh, CraftKit and Unicraft sit in a little bit of a interesting situation. Uh, we are a Linux foundation project, but the tooling that we build is uh, very CNCF. Um, but it felt appropriate today to give an update of what we've been building. Um, so CraftKit is um, the main, main topic for today, um, but it does leverage uh, Unicraft underneath. Um, so with that, I'd like to just give you an overview of the Unicraft community. So um, we're um, a distributed community. We're all open source. We're based uh, primarily uh, on GitHub um, and working um, towards building um, uh, softwares and tools uh, for the cloud. Um, we come from academia, a lot of us. Uh, so we've published a lot. So we've given lots of talks and presentations. There's around uh, 60 active contributors to um, the different parts of the Unicraft ecosystem coming from different uh, uh, walks of life, whether that's uh, institutes and companies, uh, universities, um, there are many students and uh, professors that teach um, uh, parts of Unicraft or work with Unicraft. Um, the core team distributed across the maintainers across, uh, across six countries, um, and the project has been active uh, roughly for about five years now. So uh, a little introduction to Unicraft for those uh, uninitiated. Um, it is an alternative application runtime. And um, we re really mean truly alternative because it's not quite like containers and it's not quite like traditional VMs. Um, what Unicraft does is it builds something called a single address space kernel binary. So this is a binary that, if you think about compiling your application to a, a binary, um, Maybe you compile it statically so that it wouldn't have any shared objects. In this case, you usually target a um, distribution like Linux um, and an architecture. Um, but with Unicraft, we now target a virtual machine uh, monitor, so uh, a particular hypervisor, um, so that it executes directly as a virtual machine. But it's still similar to a process in that it's no longer being managed by a traditional operating system like Linux, it's now being managed by the hardware and the virtual machine monitor. Um, with Unicraft, we have kind of three pillars, three goals that we work towards, and that's application performance, security, and portability or compatibility. So the basic premise of applications that are run in the cloud today is that you want great performance, you want to make sure that your application is secure, and you actually also want to make sure that it runs. And so this is where Linux has and other traditional monolithic uh, kernels and operating systems 
have been major players. And so we find that Linux is the de facto kernel um, for many deployments today as virtual machines um, or even on bare metal because it app offers today basically a very large and safe space for you to kind of execute your application, meaning your application will pretty much run, right? You, you're guaranteed that it will be executed on this platform. Um, this is thanks to things like uh, POSIX, um, but also many applications built against Linux. And so this Linux itself exposes something called syscalls and you build to those syscalls. So people want to build their application, make sure that it is executed on different places. Think about it like a large data center um, on the machine, right? Um, so we want to make sure that the same applications that people are running today are perfectly compatible so that you don't have to think about porting your application to Unicraft. It is compatible with existing applications. So the Unikernel model is basically one where you have your traditional application and you traditionally compile it against third-party libraries. You run it on an operating system that in itself has potentially libraries or certain features or functions or services. And this on itself is run on top of a monolithic kernel. This then runs on a hardware software platform. The unikernel model breaks down all of the parts that are underlying to the application into a modular system called a library operating system that allows you to then compose your application into a final binary image that's able to execute on the same hardware platform combination. So this allows you to specialize your application without needing to use all of the components of a traditional Linux kernel stack, which you would not otherwise configure yourself. You simply download the latest binary that's produced from your favorite distribution, such as Debian, and it's pretty much sealed. You don't really change it. Maybe you do an upgrade, but you don't customize it in the same way that you customize a library operating system. Here, for example, we speak about core primitives from an operating system. For example, whether you would like a particular scheduler, a particular memory manager, um, some uh, particular uh, shared object libraries, you know, things like OpenSSL, whether you want this as part of your you know, final kernel binary that is then shipped and then run on the um, uh, whatever hardware platform combination that you desire. Um, where CraftKit fits into all of this is that it's a companion tool for the Unicraft library operating system. It allows you to manage project library dependencies, meaning that you can pick and select from a pool of libraries and, and choose them and decide that they are part of the build of your application. Then allows you to build your application as a unikernel, this final binary image that executes as a virtual machine. And also particularly, which has been more important recently is packaging of the unikernel. So as to allow people to distribute these kernels in a friendly and compatible way with the rest of the CNCF ecosystem. A recent addition has been a daemonless runtime to CraftKit that allows you to manage these virtual machines. I'll get into this a little bit later. So some highlighted development efforts that have happened over the last few months is that we've integrated Firecracker as a virtual machine monitor into CraftKit, allowing you to target Firecracker as a virtual machine monitor and execute it using the underlying machine interface. This allows you to directly interface with the Firecracker binary and instantiate the virtual machine in this manner. Unicraft now supports Firecracker, which has made this possible. Additionally to CraftKit has been a built-in network management system that allows you to manage host networking and then connect your unikernel to different uh, networking interfaces. Uh, this is an extensible system. And for now we've supported uh, Linux bridging. A CNCF related topic is that we've built a way to package unikernels using the OCI distribution and image specification. So this takes the final binary image and kind of puts it inside of the OCI uh, format, which if you think about it, it's just a tarball with some artifacts inside of it. There's been a number of caveats in approaching it in this way. Whilst it is perfectly possible to put whatever you want inside of it, many OCI compliant registries and um, tools and services don't fully exploit uh, the OCI image specification perfectly. Um, for example, uh, many OCI registries still expect, for example, a manifest to have layers. So we've had to incorporate 
putting the unit kernel in a layered format where we say the file system contains this kernel binary and maybe some auxiliary artifacts when in fact it would have been much easier to, for example, just say this particular blob of this OCI manifest represents a kernel. The latest addition has to Crockett has been the ELF loader. The ELF loader is a type of unique kernel that is able to run your native Linux user space application binary that has been pre-compiled. This makes it truly extensible um, and allows you to use Unikernels quite effortlessly without having to compile your application against Unicraft itself. So these are main. Uh, these are some of the main highlights um, from CraftKit today. And actually, I'd love to just jump straight into some demos uh, showing you how to use CraftKit and uh, what it can do. So with that, okay. So can you see my terminal? Yep. Yeah. I'm wondering if I shared my screen or just the window. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, so um, let me just go through the help prompt. So the latest version of uh, CraftKit we actually released uh, earlier just today. Uh, I had a couple of bug fixes, but um, I'm going to go through the main kind of components of CraftKit from a terminal perspective. So we have some build commands that help you build your application as a unikernel. Um, once you're finished uh, building your application, there are some packaging uh, commands that help you curate the package, whether that's the specific libraries that you are building. For example, if you are building a library for um, the library to be part of the library operating system ecosystem, then there are ways to package it this way. Um, there's also ways to package the final pre-built binary. I'll show you how to do this. Um, then there are some runtime commands um, that have been modeled very closely to uh, Docker and NerdCTL and other um, container runtime uh, tooling uh, programs that make it feel like that you're running a, a, a container image, but in fact, we're running a unikernel. And then also some networking commands that uh, help with a little bit more network uh, advanced networking situations. Um, so with that, let me just clone a example app. So uh, we have at Unicraft uh, main organization on GitHub, a whole suite of applications. Uh, one of them is just called Hello World. Uh, I'm gonna check, is it clean? Yeah, okay. So yeah, I'm just gonna clone this again, sorry. Oh, app. The Hello World application is basically a very simple, yeah, Prince Hello World, but it's written in C. We do support some other languages. Um, so I'll show you those in a moment as well. So git clone, depth one, github.com, unicraft, just app Hello World. We have a list of these on our website, so you can check them out. Okay, so um, the first thing that you'll do once you've installed is to run craft package update. This will just gather the list of things from the remote index and shows you all the different libraries. So if I do craft package ls, I can then see all the different libraries that are kind of available to me. Um, the way that you compose an application is through a craft yaml file. The craft yaml file basically says, uh, you know, which version of Unicraft would I like? What's the name of my application? And then a list of different targets. And these targets are architecture plan platform tuples. So you can see. Um, that we're targeting, for example, a Linux user space binary and x86 or x86 uh, and targeting KNU. So I can go straight ahead and do craft build, um, which will then ask me which one of these targets that I'd like to build. Let's go to KNU x86. And what it'll do is it'll go through and get all the resources. Uh, in this case, it didn't use any external libraries. Um, it just used the Unicraft core. So it went ahead, retrieved that, and then built it as a Unicraft. So once that's built, I can now run it. I can just do craft run. It will ask me, it's now intelligently detected my host system and determined that I have Kinu installed. Um, and there are two possible targets from the previous list that have Kinu. So it's asking me which one I'd like to run. So in this case, I want this one. And it should go ahead and it's actually run, but the computer, you can run so fast that it doesn't have to I should try this again. Hold on. There we go. Um, there we go. So it's okay. It's one. It's built. Uh, if I cat the 
I think hello what was it main.c uh, yeah, main.c uh, it's printing hello world somewhere here yeah here we go um, and if I edit this file you'll see that I can rebuild it it has a whole bunch of other stuff because one of our maintainers added a monkey uh, that kind of prints out fun so uh, hello tag one time let's do craft build again uh, x86 okay it's rebuilt craft run hello tag runtime cool so this booted as a virtual machine um and was executed by key new um and we can see here that if i go into the build folder like grep by hello world we'll be able to see how big the virtual machine size is so this is the final virtual machine size it's actually 119 199 kilobytes this can be stripped even further if you do some optimizations. We didn't enable that. Um, but just to give you an illustration that it's not a full featured virtual machine like Linux. So um, this is a basic use case for CraftKit today. This is building your application as a unit kernel. A more advanced one, for example, would be to run something that is connected to a network. For this, we have built, um, uh, we can go into, for example, uh, Nginx. Let's clone the Nginx one. So git clone uh, Unicraft app Nginx. Uh, go into this one, Nginx. Oh, actually, hold on. That might not work. Um, sorry about this. This one will work. OK, craft build. So there were no targets, so it just went straight ahead and just built the only target uh, that's available. Um, of course, if you don't want to build things from source, and this is the next point that I'll get to, we have um, pre-built and we can access these through OCI registries and we do distribute them. Um, you can push them to actually any OCI registry because they're OCI compliant. So this is just showing you that there were more, um, let's see, craft file. That there were more option sets. So we had, you know, you can specify K config options, you can specify libraries, uh, the versions of those libraries. You can see I commented out uh, target here, um, and then the Unicraft core. Um, please do interrupt me, by the way, if you do have any questions. Um, have okay, question. so this has been built. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, can you run this? Is running on a bare metal machine? Can you? Uh, yes. Pulling? allow you to run something inside a c2 instance or, or one of the cloud cloud instances or it, for, for sure you just have to make sure that um virtualization extensions are enabled on uh the particular vm instance so um actually if you want better performance you make sure that virtualization extensions are enabled on that machine when you instantiate it as an easy to test um the same applies for gcp uh, I know that they only support certain uh, CPUs. So I think the N1 standard uh, CPUs, um, Skylake or something like this, are VMs that support uh, the virtualization extensions. However, there is, if I go into craft run, uh, H uh, less, we have a disable acceleration mode, which um, basically go enables uh, emulation. So if you have, for example, Kimu, um, can you can emulate a guest, but the execution of the unicorn will be much slower because it's no longer being executed directly by the uh, physical machines. Um, ISA instead is being executed by Kenyu. Uh, so that's a translation layer process. Got it. So it, it will run, but it, it would actually be a little bit slower or lot slower it would be yeah. slower yeah but you just have to make sure that this, it is definitely possible in most uh, infrastructures and service providers they do offer this um you just have to make sure that you do enable it um and you, have to, you kind of have to look out for a little menu or look up for particular uh, flags if you use the cli to instantiate things got it, got it. thanks cool so I built the Nginx uh, application but actually maybe say you didn't want to do this so you can still use craft run and you can point it to an OCI archive. Um, so if I do uh, craft run, uh, we host a OCI registry at unicraft.org um, and we've 
put in uh, some standard applications that we build as part of our ecosystem. So this is one of the kind of newer features. Um, and you can, um, it will, what it will do is it will fetch this process and it will boot, right? It, will, it downloaded the unikernel uh, OCI archive, it unpacked it correctly, and now it's running. Um, so it feels a lot like you know, Docker run, you just pass in the OCI archive. In this case, it has boot, uh, but it's not attached to a network. Um, so I do craft PS. Uh, you can see these are my hello world ones that uh, were running a few seconds ago, but uh, a few minutes ago, uh, but I've exited. And we have the Nginx instance that's also running. Um, but if I do craft long, we have some additional information about ports and IPs. And, and no port or IP has been assigned to this instance. So I should just remove it and attach it to a network. So if I do craft net ls, um, I can see networks that are on the host that are based off bridge networking. Um, so I have container D installed, so I have CNI and NerdCTL, um, but I've also created a custom network here uh, called craft um, uh, zero. This feature allows us to connect containers and unikernels together in case you have a mixed system. Um, so if you're slowly onboarding different applications as unikernels, you don't have to take all of them off online. You, you don't have to worry about networking. This kind of covers you. Um, so I can do, I can attach it to one of these networks, um, but with it's a type bridge. So I do it like this. And then I do the same thing before. Nginx latest. Great. And so now you can see actually it was set my IP address. If I do craft PS long. I can see the IP address here and I can curl it. Cool. So here we go. And then I can also do, I can get the logs from this. Cool. So you can see I got a curl. And cool. So this is one way of uh, attaching it to a network. Let me kill everything. Okay. And then you can also just do port forwarding. So if I see there's nothing running, craft run, I do a port forward. So let's do 8484 mapped to 80. And then unicraft.org, which is the nginx uh, OCI image with the unikernel in it. Here we go. Okay, it's now acquired an IP address, but if I run 8484 curl localhost 8484, I should get the same thing. Cool. So that is um, handling the runtime of applications and the distribution of applications. Um, it's actually, I actually didn't show you the distribution. So if I go back to uh, my uh, craft kit examples app nginx, craft remove all, because I just want to kill everything. I'm actually going to run prune and I'm going to remove some uh just some artifacts to show you that uh there's nothing here uh pre-built and i can like, kind of start from scratch if i do craft package ls you'll see i just have now uh, these libraries and the core application but if i were to uh, now package this pre-built or this say you've built this application nginx is just the example here and you want to package it and distribute it and send it to an oci registry you just do craft package. I want to package it as an OCI. And then I want to give it a tag like unicraft.org nginx latest. And then you can also pass in some other things. So um, for example, a root file system in the sort of virtual machine world is an init RAM. So let's pass it an init RAM. Um, and the init RAM is uh, just a CPIO archive. So this is pre-built CPIO archive. Um, and there we go, it built, it just put everything, it's very quick because there's only a unit kernel in it RAM, it just has to put this together inside of an archive, which represents the OCI sort of specification for an image. Um, and if I now do craft package LS, uh, you can see that it's now here, right? So I, I can actually view all the pre-built um, unit kernels that I want to distribute. And of course, now I can push this straight to a registry uh, of my choice. Um, and then I can also as well, just like before, run it, so unicraft.org, nginx, latest, and it should just boot. There we go. Ah, it didn't require, oh, I need to pass it in RAM. 
Okay, don't worry. Anyway, so this is kind of building unikernels from first principles where you have this prop YAML file. Um, the other use case is where you have um, your pre-built Linux binaries. So if I go into uh, where I stored uh, this. So say I've got, here we go. My simple hello world.go application and I'm printing this out. Um, when you want to build your, you, when you want to run uh, something as a unikernel, yeah, sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, that's extra noise, I think. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, so when you want to run your application on top of Unicraft and you've pre sort of, uh, it's a Linux user space uh, binary, which means that it has traditional syscalls and it's looking things up in the uh, file system uh, in terms of shared objects. Um, you have to kind of make sure of a few things. Um, one is that you can either statically compile it. Um, so if I cat my make file here, you can see that I change a few things like the, stat the position independent mode, and then that I actually um, make this a static binary. So this is one way, this guy kind of is the um, Docker container scratch image kind of way. The other way is a dynamic way. Um, this is still current work, it's currently work in progress with the Unicron community, um, but would basically allow you to run standard um, uh, things that are not uh, position independent, meaning that they look things up in the file system. But CraftKit has now this native integration that allows you to run Unicraft in this mode and accept a binary that is traditionally built for a unikernel, uh, not for not for a unikernel and for Linux. Um, and it's accessible just through craft run. It kind of intelligently determines that it is a Linux user space binary. Uh, when I do craft run, it downloads something called a loader. And there it is. It's, uh, it's a sort of boot and it runs. Um, the loader unikernel application is a little bit like a fat uh, unikernel. It's still much more lightweight than running a full Linux distribution and can also in itself be tailored for the unikernel. Um, this is part of the goal towards compatibility. So if you have a application that you don't want to modify, um, but you do know what's inside of it, you know, maybe for uh, licensing reasons, or maybe it's a legacy application, you don't want to change it you can build a unikernel that targets it and you can load it on top of it. Okay, great. So that's kind of concludes the demo. Um, the last question. part of this presentation. Yes, about that, yeah. um, if, uh, if you package um, more binaries into the unikernel, like if you package mm -hmm. bash or a bunch of libraries in there, okay. Is it possible so to batch, kind, of, kind of like do Docker exact or something or do like craft exact into the, the unikernel slash container and basically for debugging purposes? So this is a great question. Um, Bash is a program that forks and fork is an inherently multi-process um, syscall that um, completely uh, uh, copies the stack and, and, and basically starts a new process um, on top of the um, sort of kernel in, in sort of user space. Uh, Fork is currently not supported by Unicraft, meaning that programs like Bash cannot exist. Um, there is currently a uh, line of work by a working group uh, looking at something called vFork and the compatibility between Fork and vFork and different applications. So as to potentially enable applications such as Bash. Um, on the question of debuggability of unikernels and wanting to, for example, exec, it is still possible for, to build um, a, and I think there is someone looking into this, building a kind of um, API that then allows a, you basically connect through a port, almost like Telnet, and then you get access to a very primitive shell that allows you to dump registers of you, the file system, or things like this. Um, but right now, doing something similar to uh, Docker exec or kubectl exec is not quite possible with Unicraft in general. Um, that doesn't mean that unikernels are inherently difficult to debug. Um, they are uh, it, very similar to uh, standard applications that run uh, when they're targeted to Linux, um, for example. So you can run GDB. Um, you can use your integrated um, developer environment to step through things. 
you can see the boundary, you can cross the boundary between your application and the kernel. Uh, interestingly, to see where you could, for example, see performance optimization paths. Um, but at runtime, um, right now, no, you can't do things like exec. Uh, but it is definitely on the horizon with regard to the Unicraft core, which CraftKit wraps. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. No worries. So the next well, question interrupted, I had, oh, yes. I had one other no question. Um, yes, I was just curious, uh, very early on in the talk, you mentioned that um, there are kind of hardware dependent drivers and things um, bound into the uh, container or, or the, your uh, unikernel. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the diagram there. So I was just curious uh, to what extent that makes these non-portable uh, or, or to what extent you have to know you know, a lot about the, the specific hardware that you're going to deploy these things onto? I think this is a great question. So um, Unicraft and CraftKit tackle this in a number of different ways, uh, kind of depending on the way that you look at this, this problem. So the first is um, Unicraft itself as a library operating system is um, POSIX compliant, Linux Cisco compliant. I mean, your application doesn't have to think about the underlying platform drivers. All you must do is select them if you know where you are targeting your application to go. So if you say, okay, I'm targeting, if, if for example, you're talking like a very specific, um, okay, so say for example, you want to speak to a particular device on a machine, you could build a uh, driver into Unicraft and allow your device to connect to that um, through the Unicraft build system. Um, but of course, there are some kind of generic platform drivers that are also built into Unicraft. And you basically select them at a high level. You don't change your application, you simply change your target. So this is that list of targets that I showed you before in the craft.yaml file, where you might change your where the output might go. This is why the Hello World application had so many different targets. This list of targets is just a sample. There can be many more. And you can even be infrastructure as a service um, specific. So um, we have, for example, uh, platform drivers that target AWS uh, or GCP that make use of their particular networking hardware specifics, right? Because they obviously run their own machines, uh, oh, sorry, own hardware. Um, but you don't really have to think about that from a you developer perspective from your application. You just change that selection from the selection menu where you want to go. Now, an additional compatibility that um, CraftKit offers is through uh, the OCI package manager. Internal to CraftKit allows you to, based on the OCI image specification, set an OS and architecture distribution tuple. So when you look at the OCI image specification, it says, and we're all aware of this, right? You could go to a registry, you can pull based on whether you're on Linux or on Windows or on ARM or on x86, right? We inject ourselves into that part of the specification and say, we now ta ta uh, target this particular platform. So TeamU is an OS, um, Firecracker is an OS, um, maybe your infrastructure as a service provider, such as AWS EC2 instances is an OS. Um, and then the architecture is obviously the same. Um, this is kind of where the OCI image specification has had a kind of revelation. This is quite, uh, is quite good in this, in this part, but it's only used right now quite narrowly in the larger um, sort of traditional container ecosystem where this is just the, you know, Linux, FreeBSD, Windows, whatever. Um, and then uh, kind of a, a side note to that, this particular uh, part of the image specification has something called OS features. I think if I go so OCI image spec, I can actually just show you by example. Um, image, is it image index? Yeah, here we go. So the part of the image uh, uh, specification so is that you can put a platform and this contains an architecture and OS. Um, they give Golang's GOS as an example, but we put here like key new firecracker, as I said, and then they have something called OS features. Um, this is only actually used for Windows at the moment, but what we do is we put all the kconfig options because Unicraft's build system is based on a, off of kconfig, very similar to the Linux kernel. We set all those kconfig options. So actually we can pull from a registry 
based if you have for example craft installed on a particular machine that has a specific driver requirement that goes beyond whether it's key or firecracker maybe you require for example something a specific hardware driver platform, we can now query an OCI compliant registry for OS features and say we want the unikernel that has the specific driver, not only the platform, whether it's KMU or Firecracker or, or VMware or whatever. Okay, and, and all of this is presumably done at build time while you're busy building the microkernel. That's right, um, that's right. Yeah, and so at deployment you basically, time, you, you might end yeah. up with you know hundreds of these you know, roughly equivalent things, right. each one targeting a very specifically different kind of machine or platform. Yeah. Okay, cool. Exactly. Thank you so much. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, so just next steps, uh, we're going to be building a file system volume manager into CraftKit. Right now we just support um, init RAM FS, um, but we want to target uh, more specific uh, volume uh, type um, systems where they might be, uh, for example, putting in some of these drivers, checking whether the drivers um, for Unicraft um, are enabled um, or being able to run specific um, uh, commands to package it correctly. For example, building the actual blob that represents a, a file system. You can think of MKFS types, uh, uh, be, uh, commands being run under the hood. Um, then more integration with the container shim V3 API integration, this is currently ongoing. So um, the Sandbox API is currently still being developed and we're trying to have a, uh, sort of have a part of, be part of that conversation um, to see how we can uh, better develop the Sandbox API towards this micro V um, unikernel um, world that is being used for, for OCI archives and the kind of constraints that come out of using unikernels with traditionally CNCF um, projects. Um, and then a little bit more down the line is a build kit D integration so that you don't have to run um, craft. You can just use, uh, for example, Docker, and it just talks to um, the build kit daemon and is able to build a unikernel for you in this way. So I think that was probably a jam packed amount of uh, information. Um, I don't know if I ran over time or not, um, but uh, I'd be happy to hear if you have any more questions. Thank you. You're fine. We have another 20 minutes. All right. Okay. Great. Yeah, but are there any other questions? I can maybe do some more demoing if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a kind of a, a very hand wavy um, question, but yeah. so as you say, this is a very different approach. You know, if, if people have to choose between uh, deploying applications and VMs, for example, traditional old VMs, KVM or whatever. Right. Uh, and a Docker container, you know, it's it's reasonably clear what the pros and cons of both are, and and it's easy to choose which might be better for your particular application. Um, where do you see this approach being superior to the alternatives or inferior? You know, like how would you advise people to decide whether this was a good way to do their particular application? So, going back kind of to the pillars of the Unicraft um, project. Um, and what it is trying to achieve is um, performance and security combined, um, where you look at the number of, for example, CVEs that are coming out from um, running your uh, container in the cloud, because it's basically running, it's, it's, it's trusting the um, operating system underneath. Um, so anything that is able to uh, bypass uh, in this situation compromises all of the applications. So you get the security guarantee of virtualization primitives from your um, ISA, from your hardware. Um, so anybody who's security conscious, this might be a strong motivation to use. Um, we often think of the standard deployment model of Kubernetes is to run your node pool with many virtual machines. And that's because the virtual machine still today is the unit of isolation with regard to security. The second pillar is the performance, where by removing the boundaries between the user space application and the kernel space part of the full stack, actually not only removes the guard, which Every syscall is a guard. It is checking whether the user space application is allowed to perform 
that uh, particular syscall. That guard is from is changed from 300 roughly CPU cycles to three CPU cycles, and because the syscall is no longer doing all of its additional mechanics to determine the permissioning of that call, because it is now part of the same single address space binary, that call is permitted to do that. That syscall effectively becomes a function call, and so can even be inlined. So you can perform cross um, system optimizations that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do with Unicraft that you would otherwise have to do a lot of manual tweaking of your kernel operating system. And this would be per virtual machine, right? You'd have to tweak every virtual machine. Um, but you also wouldn't be able to necessarily always get that kind of performance because, for example, you might have to bypass the kernel in some cases. So, for example, another project uh, a little while back to, great, to get great network performance, you might bypass the uh, Linux networking um, system entirely and speak directly to the hardware. So you're, cu you're, you're cutting through what is, you know, that VM, that kernel has all the functionality, but you don't want it because it's very slow. So you bypass it entirely. Unicraft offers this kind of out of the box. Um, and we find that running traditional applications that are run in the cloud, like Nginx, Redis, et cetera, um, or your Go application or something or other, usually gets um, between, I think, is it 50 to 150% performance increase, uh, depending obviously on the workload and the application. Um, so there really is a strong argument for people who are performance um, conscious to also want to use Unicraft as an alternative way to run your application. Now, one of the side effects of having great performance of your application uh, through the use of a unikernel is that it re reduces your operational expenditure if you decide to scale back the VM instance that would have otherwise been running the full stack application. Because you are no longer using a uh, full, stack, full stack kernel, um, meaning the application, the auxiliary services that run alongside it, such as SSH or system D um, and everything else or other in a traditional deployment of an operating system, because you are removing all of it and, and you are getting much better performance, you can reduce that instance size. And as a result, you are able to reduce the cost of that application as well. So there is also an argument, I see this a lot in, you know, recent recent uh, KubeCons, for example, that there's a lot of people speaking about the, reducing the cost of the cloud. Um, there's an argument there for people who are trying to be a little bit more conscious for uh, so on this degree. Um, and of course, because you're also using less resources, there's an element of um, being sort of a little bit more eco-friendly. This is a little bit of an alternative way to try and facilitate running application in a more green environment right where we don't have to use as many resources because it's kind of the bulk of so many things that are wasted, uh, you know, wasting CPU cycles kind of doing nothing being totally um, redundant in terms of application functionality. Awesome thanks that was a very useful answer. Chris. I have a, another question related to some of the hype going on with machine learning and AI. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering yeah, cool. if um, uh, you have in the roadmap um, the support for GPUs or um, people trying to, to run those type of uh, workloads. Yes, people have and people do. And uh, there's a project called VXL uh, from, I think, yeah, there's a talk at FOSDEM um, so these guys, uh, we know them from a, a little while now. And basically what they did was they added uh, platform um, and yeah, platform drivers to Unicraft that allowed um, you to directly access the um, sort of uh, ABI of a uh, GPU, so that you could offload compute to that GPU from the perspective of a unit kernel. Um, so this allows you to, for example, run a, a machine learning model through Unicraft. It would obviously be offloaded to the GPU. Uh, and so the Unicraft kind of facilitates that communication. It's a much more lightweight 
way to facilitate that communication. Um, there has, there's definitely, obviously, it's a, it's a huge amount of hype. There's a lot of people talking about it. Uh, it's making waves at the moment. Um, and it is, it is definitely possible. This is something that we have wanted to try and upstream to uh, Unicraft Core. I, I just think um, there's been a lot of hand struggling, a lot of other uh, pieces at the moment, um, uh, trying to get a little bit more stability and trying to target a little bit more uh, cloud vendors and virtual machine monitors and hypervisors um, and also increasing its kind of stability. But yeah, for sure, um, there's definitely a way these guys were able to do it. Um, and they have a great talk um, that they gave um, at Vostum. Um, I think it was it this year? Yeah, uh, explaining exactly how they were able to do this. Got it, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard of Anastasius. Um, yeah, this is great. I think uh, uh, it's in the roadmap. Not quite there yet, but like in the roadmap. Yeah, for sure. I, I'd say, it's, yeah, it's on the roadmap. Oh, another question that, I mean, there's a lot of uh, talk about WebAssembly. I'm wondering where all this, um, some of this unikernel stuff fits together with WebAssembly or, or this, this will be more something of an alternative or it will be something that could be tied together uh, with WebAssembly. I mean, the yes. conversation around WebAssembly is like, oh, it's really lightweight and um, it can be used for workloads at the edge or, or it, I mean, you can create your tiny microservices. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there, if, if you see any any um, connection or any. Mm -hmm. Any way that these technologies can work side by side, or or they can work together? Sure. So um, uh, WebAssembly is a very interesting. Um, I think I start with calling it an idea that's developed into um, a quite interesting ecosystem. Um, so the, I think the idea of WebAssembly being a kind of hardware independent ISA for the cloud. Um, grew and evolved over the years to become what is now basically a microservice runtime where we can be independent of the language, target the ISA, and now be able to run on these different places. Uh, I don't see so much um, WebAssembly being deployed, or maybe I'm just not aware, on the browser, which I think is one of the ideas uh, of WebAssembly. And now more it's proliferated to being executed directly on sort of edge devices. Uh, very close to home. Um, and as a runtime, WebAssembly has its place with Unicraft as the application. So um, the uh, so the WebAssembly, I think it was the, it's the Bytecode Alliance, right? Um, they have a runtime uh, called, uh, yeah, I think it was first WAMR, the WebAssembly micro runtime, WAMR. Um, so this can run on top of Unicraft. Um, so basically you have your WebAssembly ISA and then you load it into the runtime and it executes. So you can have a unikernel that is built in purpose to, if kind of have, I think the best way to kind of make an analogy here is thinking of it as like uh, Python. Python is an interpreted language. So is this runtime um to some extent of course you can target it you can build it so that it becomes a final binary application that executes by itself there's a little bit more of um that possibility although you could argue that you can do the same with python with cython for example um but it definitely has its place with uh, unicraft to what extent it is um more lightweight or um uh, more secure uh, i think it's still up for debate simply because um the types of applications that run on WebAssembly and Unicrafts um, are similar and are different. So you can create um, very lightweight micro VM functions as a service unikernels um, that you would then arguably execute once per request. Um, and the same would be true for WASM or WebAssembly runtime uh, frameworks, but we have um, uh, WASM time as well. There's also WASM cloud where this is kind of the main operation is the main goal. Um, I think a similarity that to uh, another project um, is uh, functions as a service. Um, what's it called? 
Fez. Okay, Native, K- yes, K Caves is, is also a good one. Um, yeah. Um, so it's I think it definitely sits in there. The difference being that you don't have to target a WebAssembly uh, ISA. You don't have, you know, you wouldn't have to use this kind of transpiler to turn your application language into a WebAssembly ISA and then execute it. You can actually be fully POSIX compliant or use your Linux user space binary through the ELF loader and run it this way. So I think there's a lot of reasons to compare between the two and also an overlap where Unicraft can execute the WebAssembly. So we have a um, port of this web WebAssembly micro runtime uh, called AppWebber. And so here um, we have a craft file, we have the main byte uh, ISA, this main dot wasm, and you basically, it runs on top of the um, WAMA runtime uh, here. So you just compile this as part of your application unikernel and you can go ahead and you can get started. Um, now you get the benefits of it running as a virtual machine uh, and you can do cross layer optimization again, where you can, for example, tune your unikernel, change the libraries, mess with the different ways that the stack, uh, for example, you, you know, with Unicraft, you can really customize the networking stack. This is where a lot of um, performance benefits come from. If you know, for example, that your application is going to be running very sh small, short packets over UDP, for example, like a streaming service, um, then you might tune your uh, uh, networking stack to accommodate for this type of networking traffic, changing the the, the overflow sizes or buffer rates or, or, or window sizes, etc. And then you would you know, get a great performance for that particular target use case. Whereas you would not necessarily have to do you not necessarily fully be able to do this if you were a, sh a shared runtime in a virtual machine running your WebAssembly at the edge. Right, there'd be a lot more um, uh, overhead. The right? Overhead, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Cool. That makes sense. So, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there's a path basically for people right. maybe with a bunch of WebAssembly modules and they want to optimize performance and th this this could be mm -hmm. a, an alternative um, for those people trying to, yeah, trying to handle those type of types of applications. Right. Are there any other questions? Uh, I cannot see any questions in the chat. Anyone wanted to discuss this? No. All right. So I think this is great. It was like a really great uh, presentation. Thank you so much, oh, Alexander. Thanks so much. No worries. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I think uh, we can uh, end this meeting this week. And uh, hopefully, we can see you next time. Thank you, everyone. That's good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great Bye. presentation. Ciao. Thank you.